everyone, what an immense honor and pleasure to launch into the October 2022 edition of um, Living Histories uh, with Simone Alexander from um, Auburn University. Without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Simone to tell us about Living Histories. Awesome, thank you, Sheree. Oh, I'm so excited to be here and thank you for inviting me to do this. I never thought I'd be talking about the history of my life thus far this soon, but um, I hope you all enjoy my journey. So I started by, I kind of formatted this as like a, a roadmap, but I also wanted to highlight kind of the key questions I asked myself at each stage and how those changed as I kind of progressed through my career. So. I grew up most of the time in Denver, Colorado. This is a picture on this far left. Um, we moved around a lot as kids. So you see, my sisters are gonna kill me for this photo in the bottom left, but the spiders have been there all along um, with our, our Spider-Man suits here. Um, but what I wanna highlight is that my mom, that's down in this uh, photo in the bottom right, I don't know if I have a laser pointer, Oops. but she's down uh, in this photo in the bottom right. She really encouraged us to figure out what we like to do. And so she used to buy me all these science kits. I always wanted the Discovery Channel things. I would watch National Geographic, PBS all the time. Uh, different shows telling us about the world and nature. Um, and so it really framed my idea of like, okay, I really like science. I really wanna understand how in particular nature works and how plants and things that really can't think the way humans do operate in the world. And so, Fast forward to high school, where, you know, the question then became, okay, what career should I choose? I know what I like to do. I know I love nature, in particular animals. And I'm trying to figure out, okay, how does that align with my career? So in this bottom left is my AP chemistry teacher, Mr. Nichols. Um, I thought for the longest time I was going to go to biology, and then I was going to be a veterinarian because I loved animals. So this picture in the top right is my cat who I called Moo because she had spots like a cow. Um, but I knew I was going to be a veterinarian because I loved animals. One thing that switched me from biology to chemistry was this amazing educator. There was one thing he used to say to us all the time. If we answered a question incorrectly, he would say, that's okay, rookie mistake. The reason why I love that is because saying that it was a rookie mistake indicated that, yes, we may have gotten it wrong this time, but it was only because we were new. We had just learned the information. And so if we practiced, if we kept at it, we could do it. It wasn't about intelligence. It was about working hard to learn something. And so for me, that was amazing. At the same time, I learned that at the heart of biology, there's a lot of chemistry. Everything is made up of atoms, electrons. So it, it really changed my perspective from going to biology to, okay, I can go to chemistry. I can still get to be a veterinarian through there. Um, and also during high school, I was involved in all kinds of stuff. Believe it or not, I was a cheerleader, a dancer, all of these things. So I had a good time. Um, and so that started my first pathway. So I switched to this chemistry pathway. So the next stage was actually undergraduate. So I started out and I was deciding on schools and, you know, I was thinking, okay, I need to go to the best of the best. Well, my mom again comes in and she said, well, I would really love if you would go to Howard University. And I was like, what is Howard University? She was like, it's a historically black college or university. And if um, you're unfamiliar with what that is, it means that the major student population is black and historically has been so. Um, and so I was still on the fence and she drove me and my sisters 26 hours to DC to this visit weekend. And it was the first time in my life I was in an academic environment where I wasn't the only person who looked like me. In fact, everyone around me looked like me. Um, and it was really eye-opening and allowed me to be myself in a way that I hadn't yet been able to. And while we were there, so Howard University is set in the middle of Washington, DC. Me and my mom got lost on the way to the chemistry building and got lost actually in the chemical engineering building. We ended up going into the dean's office where she started talking to me about my goals, walking me into campus and said, well, why don't you try chemical engineering? It's a little bit more math and a little bit more physics. I didn't know much about physics yet, but I was like, I can do some math. It's cool. And most of all, she said they had scholarship money, which is even more important because I had a tuition scholarship, but not necessarily housing. So I was like, Washington, D.C., housing paid for. That sounds good to me. 
So I joined the chemical engineering department instead. So I switched my major from chemistry to chemical engineering. And while I was there, I started to ask more than what career that I wanted, but what do I want to be? So traditional chemical engineers that I was exposed to while at Howard were in the oil and gas industry, which for me as a nature lover, I was like, mm, that's not for me. Or they were in the food industry, which was cool, but not necessarily where I wanted to be. And so entered in Dr. Joseph Cannon up here in the top right. Um, and he was the first person to suggest to me graduate school. He said, you know, I've been looking at your exams and the way you answer questions reminds me a lot of my graduate students. So from the next summer, I joined Robert Tweet's group at Kent State University doing a summer research experience. That was my first introduction to research or graduate school as a whole. And it really changed my perspective of what I could do in a career and what a next step could be besides going straight into industry. While I was there, I met Dave Schiraldi, who's at Case Western. He said, hey, if you like this, we have a program at Case that focuses on polymers. I had no idea what polymers or material science were, but I was excited about it and excited about doing more research. Now, I was thinking about materials, but I was like, okay, this doesn't really tie in with my love for nature. And so down in the, um, the mid right is Dr. Preeti Chandran. She was the first person who introduced the fact that materials and biology can go hand in hand. She was making these particles made of DNA, DNA and a um, polyelectrolyte that could be used to deliver drugs for HIV and AIDS. So it was a really cool kind of combination of biology and materials that I hadn't seen before. So um, this middle picture is my graduating class of chemical engineers, which you may notice doesn't look like a graduating class of chemical engineers in many other places, um, but it really was amazing for me. I also met my amazing spouse there, which leads to my next crossroads, which was graduate school. So thus far, I had now identified myself as a chemical engineer, and I was like, okay, I'm a chemical engineer through and through. But I, I wanted to explore this field of polymer engineering. The graduate program at Case Western was polymer engineering. And I was introduced to my PhD advisor, Dr. LaShonda Corley. She was the first um, African-American woman that I saw in the space as a faculty member that taught me. Um, and one of the things that I realized was that her legacy was the same. Her advisor, Dr. Paula Hammond, who was at MIT and still is at MIT as the department chair in chemical engineering, was there as well. So I started to see this legacy of opening doors and building pathways for others and started to ask my question, who do I want to be? So it's more than my career, but who do I want to actually be as a person? My mom continued to support me. She came to every lab thing, put on lab goggles, lab coats. And then I started to develop this community of people that not only supported me, but encouraged me to be more than I could have ever imagined. And so for my graduate career, I switched fields again and went into polymer engineering, but with some chemical engineering focus. So another thing I like to mention is that at this stage, I still was iffy about physics. I was like, I don't, I don't really know if I like it. From engineering physics, it was mostly, you know, falls rolling down hills, or this is how you keep the structure, you know, stable. It wasn't very interesting to me. So this was my first introduction to polymer physics. So looking at the chemistry side of physics in a more dynamic, kind of relevant perspective for me. So I was like, okay, I still am not sold on physics, but it's interesting. Um, and so then enter my postdoc. So when I was searching for a postdoc, I was at a crossroads um, between two great postdoc opportunities and fellowships and a really, you know, predominant famous advisor and this junior PI with a lot of personality saw Bamla at Georgia Tech. Um, but one thing that really made the difference for me, and it kind of ties back into my childhood, was that the research project that he proposed had to do with going into the Amazon rainforest. So if you remember from my first slide, I love Discovery Channel, National Geographic, and all the world specials always include the Amazon rainforest. And so Saad told me about this project, and I was really excited about it, but it included spiders, but it also focused on biophysics. And I was like, oh, come on with the physics, here it comes again. Um, but I realized that this form of physics was something that I love, the physics of living systems, and allowed me to see this not only as something that may be complicated and difficult to describe, but also something that united very intimately with what I love and who I am as a person. And so in my postdoc, 
I started to really ask myself, well, who am I as a person and what do I enjoy doing? And regardless of, you know, where people think I should go, where do I want to go? Um, and so during my postdoc, I truly explored the world in so many ways, um, both in research and in my career, but also um, in my personal life. And so it really made the difference for me and made it easy for me then as a faculty member to start to think about who I will be to others. So I'm still writing this part of the story, obviously, but my group, I say that I'm a chemical engineer who uses physics and materials or polymers engineering to solve complex problems in biology. And that's what my group does. I do what I love every day. I'm solving exciting and interesting problems. Um, but along with that, I started to grow and appreciate myself as a person, both in my family life. I have an awesome two-year-old. We just found out we have a little girl on the way. So building that as well as part of my legacy. Um, going back to PBS, being featured there as a scientist and someone who inspired others is really important for me, being the representation that I didn't see until I was a lot older, as well as these amazing students and, and mentees that I have now in my group, hopefully being that launching pad for them to help them understand that there is no one right path, there is no one right field, and it's okay to change paths at any point. So, with that, I'll pause there and say that is my story thus far, and hopefully I'll have more to tell you 10 years from now. Um, thank you so much, Simone. On behalf of the audience, I'm clapping. Uh, we have time for a um, couple of questions. Um, if anyone wants to throw questions into chat, um, if not, let me get uh, started. We have a shy audience. Um, <laughs> You, you said uh, these very powerful words about not only discovering what you wanted to work on, but also who you were, what you enjoyed, no matter what people thought you should do, what you wanted to do. Um, so now that you have the, the role of mentoring others like yourself uh, into these future paths, how do you, tell them that they can do all of this in academia? Yes, yes, that's a that's an excellent question. Um, I actually have two students going into preliminary qualifiers right now that are having an existential crisis about whether they've made the right decision about, about life right now. Um, and really what I try to ask them is a lot of the questions I ask myself, what do you like to do? If you were to wake up tomorrow and start your career, what do you imagine that looking like? And so it's more uh, trying to get them or, or trying to understand who they are as people and getting to know their hobbies and interests as well as just asking them, do you like doing this? I have a student that started out experiments in my group and he walked in my office last month and was like, I really don't like the lab. Can we add some computational elements? And so we're working on building that into this project with another faculty member, because I have no idea about computational stuff. But it's things like that. And I think having an open dialogue with them where they feel like they can come and say, you know, I really don't like this. How can we adjust and, and change that? So giving them the space to be themselves and to really just figure that out and trying to guide them as much as I can or find the right people who can if I don't know anything about it. Super, thank you. Um, we have a burning question about spiders. Uh, <laughs> um, what is your favorite thing you've discovered about spiders? Oh my gosh, my favorite thing. Oh, that's, it's kind of hard, but I think my favorite thing that I discovered is how they spin different types of silk for different purposes and that not all spiders spin the same silk. It seems like you should, it should be obvious, I don't know, because they're all spiders, but I didn't realize both chemically, structurally, mechanically, how many different types of silk a single spider can spin. Um, and they're actually quite intelligent, which I also didn't realize. But once you realize something has more of a brain, I think it's less fear and more like, oh, you're kind of cool. Awesome. Thank you so much again, Simone. In the interest of time, I'm closing the recording.